Late Night Fishing, Part 1 Written by you slash Sills Bitten It's Friday night, and my garage is a flurry of activity as two of my good friends, Wes and Brandon, are checking their backpacks and stocking the cooler. The motion halts for a moment when I bring out the whiskey and the shots go down like a furnace. We're getting ready for another night of fishing on the lake, or pond to be more accurate. It's really just an excuse to hike through the woods and get drunk on a boat. What can I say? We live in a small town. I carry two fishing poles in one hand and a flashlight in the other. Brandon has a small cooler and one fishing pole, and Wes has a Bluetooth speaker and another flashlight. I take one more swig for the road and put the bottle in the cooler as we walk out of the garage and around the back of my house. It's not far to the entrance of the trail, and as we approach the narrow opening in the woods, Wes cuts on CCR's Born on the Bayou, and we shift into single file line as we disappear into the forest. The first half mile or so is thick with underbrush on either side, creating a winding green hallway. None of us are talking, but we don't notice it. These late night expeditions feel primal. My vision is still sharp when I focus, but the liquor has hazed my peripherals and the music thumps with our footsteps as we keep pushing down the old trail. I don't know how long the trail has been here. I discovered it after I bought the house about five years ago. We use it often enough to keep it in decent condition. That means drunkenly tossing fallen limbs and kicking old animal bones to the side. So far, we've been snaking down into and through a valley, but as we keep walking, the ground starts to slope upwards again, and the underbrush begins to fade away. Like a slow exhale, the forest begins to give the trees and us more breathing room. Other than our flashlights, it's nearly pitch black beneath the canopy except for the occasional beam of moonlight that shines through the gaps in the trees. Guys, look at this, Wes said as he turned down the music. We had fanned out a bit in the more spacious part of our journey and he was bringing up the left side. He was shining his light down at something in the forest floor and his back was to us. When I walked up, I understood why his voice sounded perplexed. There was a hole about six feet wide and four feet deep that sloped down to the center like a big bowl. In it were hundreds if not thousands of thin muddy trails that were pulled outwards from the middle in all directions. The hell? It looks like somebody was digging with their fingers, said Brandon. Yeah. This is probably the moment in a scary movie when you yell at the main character to turn back, I said. I don't watch scary movies, countered Brandon, but it's nothing some liquid courage won't fix. He breaks out the bottle again, and each of us take a pull as we stare at this strange hole. Soon, the novelty wears off and we carry on, but I notice that Brandon doesn't turn the music all the way back up and I can't help but occasionally look over my shoulder into the darkness. After about 15 minutes of walking next to what would best be described as a swamp, we come to a big clearing. It's much brighter here and the moon stares back at itself over the glass-like surface of the lake. Our canoe is stashed on the bank and after we find it, we flip it right side up and put our gear inside. I'm the last one to hop in as I push us off and we paddle out to deeper waters. The lake or pond or whatever you want to call it is about 16 or 17 acres. Big enough for canoes, bass and beavers but small enough to be hidden in the forest. It took a few minutes but after we got out near the middle of the body of water and cracked a few beers open. The mood started to lift, and the music was turned back up. You know, we've never caught one fish in this lake, laughed Wes. No, but I always catch a buzz, quipped Brandon as he simultaneously lit a cigarette and a turtle that one time. I can't help but smile when I remember the inebriated commotion that nearly flipped us after reeling in one snapping turtle. Hey, let me get one of those cigar... 
Oh, shit. I'm cut off by a loud crack and a splash a few feet from my right side. The sudden impact caused us to quickly lean in the other direction, and that sent us into a frantic balancing act. Plunk and silence. Damn beavers, Brandon shouts. I swear, when I least expect it, they sneak up and slap their tails. Did the speaker go over? I asked Wes. Yeah, it did. Sorry about that, guys. He replied, shaking his head. So good, man. Screw it. I respond. After regaining our composure, the conversation picks back up. But it doesn't feel as light and easy without the music. It's like the silence from the woods is creeping in around us. You guys want to hear something scary or at least weird? Asked Wes. Yeah, seems like a good time for that, I answered. Two nights ago, I walked to the end of my driveway to check the mail at about 6 p.m. Wes lives three doors down from me. When I got there, I saw old Mr. Barlow walking around the woods in his front yard. I was wondering what he was up to, so I walked over to say hi. He was muttering to himself and trying to tie a strap around a tree when I approached. I accidentally startled him, and when I asked what he was doing, he seemed hesitant to tell me. I pressed a little, and he said he was setting up trail cams all around his house. I know he's no hunter, so I asked why. He told me that several times over the past few weeks, late at night, when he was sitting down, something big would hit the outside of his house. He said that the noise and vibration from it was about, like, it, it would be like slamming a door. Why are you telling us this just now? I asked. Honestly, I kind of forgot. I was just ready for the weekend to start. Anyways, he said it happened in three different places in his house. Each time it was right next to him, like something knew he was there. Maybe it was a confused ear and rut or something, I said. Or deranged raccoons hurling themselves at the house, said Brandon. I don't know. But he said that the night before, he woke up at around three or four and got up to get some water. He said he went to the kitchen sink and on the other side of the window, he swore he could hear a voice whispering. What was it saying? I asked. He didn't know. He said the words didn't seem well formed, but... One phase came through clear enough a few times. Rip and snare. Dude, are you kidding me? Said Brandon. You're starting to freak me out. I'm not kidding. I thought it was creepy, but we all know he's crazy anyways. Y'all remember when he kept hauling off the Jacob's Garden gnomes across the street. He said it was running around at night, messing with his dogs. I figured this was just his latest episode. I mean, something may have hit his house, but if he's hearing voices, he's got to be imagining it, I said. Yeah, for sure, they agreed. A few minutes go by, and the conversation drifts to familiar territory. Brandon is in the middle of a story he's told a hundred times before. This tends to happen when he's drinking. His fishing pole is laying down in the boat, and he was gesturing wildly with his hands. That's when she pulled the shoe off of a random girl standing next to her at the bar and threw it right at my face point blank. That's when she pulled the shoe off of a random girl standing next to her at the bar and threw it right at my face point blank. He stops talking and we all look at the bank. Softer now and more careful. Whatever it is, it has some weight to it. But it's just beyond the tree lines and we can't see a thing. Probably just a deer, I whispered. Or a bobcat, Wes said softly. Why are we whispering, whispered Brandon. I squint my eyes and try to bring the area that the noise came from into focus. It almost looks like a, an arm that's much longer than it should be is grasping at a tree. Did you guys see that? I asked. See what? They both responded. I, I don't know. I 
think I saw someone where we put in. I don't know. I think I see someone where we put in. Suddenly the arm pulls back into the shadows. That can't be. Maybe it's just the darkness playing tricks. I think we should head back, I said. Yeah, but... Let's get out on the other side of the lake, said Wes. When we get the boat pulled up and flipped over, we grab our things and start marching back towards the house. When we get the boat pulled up and flipped over, we grab our things and start marching back towards the house. There are no trails over here and the walking is a little more difficult, but we should reconnect with the main path if we keep on our current trajectory. We've only been walking for about a minute when a long howl carries through the night. It's a coyote, said Brandon, but the howl is cut short and turns into a quick, helpless shriek. And then silence. Maybe another coyote? I offer. I feel silly for being scared, but my adrenaline is pumping despite my best efforts. My eyes are darting and we're all twitchy, but luckily... We soon reach the main trail. The closer we get back to the house, the more relief I start to feel. And up ahead, I can see the area where the underbrush goes through. And up ahead, I can see the area where the underbrush gets thicker. What the shit? Whispered Brandon. He shines his flashlight on freshly disturbed ground. I forgot about the hole. But this can't be it. It's filled in. I feel a hand on my shoulder and I jump. It's just, it's just Wes, but he's pointing about 20 feet beyond the bare dirt. Three freshly dug holes sitting side by side, each marked with ruts from long, thin fingers. Steps no more than 50 feet away. Run! I yell. We all take off towards the house, but I can hear big steps with long strides close the gap behind us and move along our left side. We all shoot to the right and a large ravine is quickly upon us. I try to plant my step to make the jump, but the ground gives way and I fall in head first. The last thing that I see is cold stone accelerating towards my face and then blackness. <laughs>